The best shooters of all times have such a unique feel, something that sticks within your memory forever. Armed with futuristic assault rifles and rechargeable shields, Halo has been at the forefront for many years. Halo has always been known for smooth movement, incredible gunplay, and depending on the title, a futuristic stylized world and stories that take from some of the very best science fiction and lodge gamers into a military warfare front in the same experience. It's that kind of gameplay that causes people to be up at 3 a.m. on Discord telling your best friend about taking out a gagla neon-colored grunts with the quickness and just barely skinning out of there before two ghosts show up to reinforce the position. Now, Bungie had something. Everybody knew Microsoft, Apple, and, of course, Bungie themselves. 343 has taken that on, and they've tried to build on it for a couple years with a give and take when it comes to their results. Halo Infinite is their next try. A single player only title. There's no multiplayer connected to this. That's free to play. There's no co-op or forge even built in. It's a bare bones package of Halo, the actual distilled down warfare that we have expected from the Halo series. Let's see if it pays off. If you like these videos, give it a thumbs up. If you don't like me, check out Writing on Games, one of the best YouTube channels that are out there. If you're one of the first 22,000 people to put a comment on this video, nothing will happen whatsoever. Can't wait. Be one of the first 22,000. This is a game that's pretty much playable on almost everything. The original all the way to the cloud. If you're somewhere in the Xbox ecosystem, get into the game quickly is as easy as booting up whatever system you have and jumping in. Whether it's on the original with sub 1080p resolution or the Xbox Series X on quality mode at dynamic 4K, Halo's hallmarks have never just been a crisp picture or resolution. In fact, we've seen prior games have sub HD resolutions and still look really good. It's the art design. It's that sci-fi reflective hex unobtainium landscape you see in Infinite that stretches in front of you as yoked gorillas in the mist rejects show up as the bad guys. On the console, the game barely ever drops a frame as well. And even a step above the preview, which did see some drops here and there, especially when you're driving around or loading in from later fast travel moments. Those are almost completely gone here. Most of the situations that we saw with draw in are improved as well in the final, though you still do see it crop up here and there. Additionally, more fleshed out is the world's wildlife, which you do see in various different ways, whether it be birds or things scurrying along the ground. The location itself in Halo Infinite looks exactly like you would expect Halo 1 as an extension to be, which I think for a lot of us is sort of where this game was going. That's, of course, when you land on the Zeta ring, because prior to that, in the first third 30 to maybe 50 minutes of Halo Infinite, this game does a lot to not impress you. It is outstandingly mediocre at the starting. I can't remember the last big budget title that didn't shock and awe when it came to especially a platform holders triple A title, but Halo Infinite certainly doesn't. Maybe it's that plan that once you get to the Halo Zeta ring, you're going to be breathing this sigh of relief that it isn't just one huge joke. I don't know, but it does sort of work in that way. It could also be bits of the delay, the old echoes and remnants and dust of the collected starts and stops that Halo Infinite had put into what is considerably not a stunning beginning. But once you get through that bit, which you could say is a small bit of a tutorial, Halo Zeta, the Zeta ring itself is a mixture of Halo 1 and 3, maybe a bit of 2 and Halo Wars combined, all to tell you the story. And that sort of does sound like a jar of bullshit where it would taste horrible when the contents are mixed up. But somehow it actually turns out to look awesome and feel awesome. This beautiful alien world that is also brutally familiar if you've played the original games. Halo games have always had a cleaner, more 2010 mix-up look, especially if you combine that with a little bit of Starship Troopers. And that's definitely what Halo Infinite looks like. The only really dark and dirty bit you get that reminds you sometimes a tiny bit of Gears are the Banished Leaders. It's been a long time since we've had a good Planet of the Apes game, but it's hard not to feel like that's what we're getting when these guys show up up. Massive thespian monkeys with a chip on the back the size of the entire family tree that you as the space marine leader have pruned prior to the story starting. Their hate for you is tangible and played out with excellent motion capture and detail when someone shows up in a cutscene to roar through a couple of minutes of dialogue. Regardless of what version you're playing and regardless of what parts come in, Halo Infinite looks damned good. Is it equal to, let's say, the absolute best of all other platform holders AAA titles? I would arguably say sometimes it's not, but still, it is assuredly Halo, and for a lot of people, that's going to be exactly what they were looking for. If you want to hear more about the deep dive and technical bits, you can check the video linked up in the top right that I already did. Let me see. 
Yes, I was right. All I need to do is chat with the Banished Security Protocol. And by chat, I mean push it out of the way because it is really not smart. And there, we now have ourselves a second fog. How many Spartans remain? Do you even know? Do you feel it in your heart? Does it leave a hole? Here we go! Now, when you're talking about audio, Halo always has done it right. Despite a couple glitches on the PC side, there's some 3D audio tracking that I found would show up as issues, especially after a clean load. I verified this with my channel tracking software. Sometimes some mixes and samples just wouldn't play, especially when they are obstructed by landscape above or below you on the PC version, something that the console version didn't seem to have any issues with. So be aware of that here though, we jump in and you have that amazing crisp and clear feeling that the halo soundscape delivers to you through your ears. And I don't think I'd trade anything for the amount of contextual information that Halo gives you, whether you're turning enemies into mobile strainers by blowing 40 bolts into them with a shotgun or a needler clip. It's great. It always is telling you some moment or bit of data. In Halo, it's always the alarm and then the whirr as your shield recharges. Almost nothing is so stuck into my DNA as that sound. It's so highly attuned that a lot of gamers know exactly how long it takes for that recharge to whirl back up. Just just by the sound, you can run towards an opening and just as the full shield turns back on, you can end up coming back out. That sound alone can lead you without vision, which is tremendous. And you can couple that now with new movements, timing that 100% shield recharge just perfectly with a grapple corner swing. Halo's audio is a tangible component of the awesomeness that is Master Chief, a replacement for the lack of verbalization, perhaps, especially for this character who usually reflects their own actions by letting the dying and retreating and burning enemy screams do all the storytelling for him. Vocally, though, when it comes to storytelling, hey, you know what? It's rogue AIs. It's some trusty Marines, all of them risking their lives just to be a part of the Master Chief's collection of stories. And as I mentioned in my preview, you've got that gung-ho feel and attitude that pays off in the narrative to make it feel like they're seeing this legend fall from the sky to help them in this unwinnable situation. Not so the Covenant and the Banished though. As they tease you and they poke and prod you as you fight them, it's hilarious if a bit different than the prior games, especially tonally. The sense of humor that's existed momentarily in prior games is much more profound here, especially on the enemy side. The grunts are consistently joking about getting paid for your death or the various different bounties that may be out on your head and all sorts of one-liners. It works. It takes a bit of getting accustomed to, but it does tell the story that the Banished have basically kicked the crap out of everybody on for so long. The USNC has got their asses kicked. Their ego is stamped down and everything else about the enemies is on top of that. And you get this very cool feeling of fiction between the two, whether you're taking over a old enemy FOB forward operating base for people who don't know, or FOB for others, or you're just exploring. There's always something there narratively and narratively isn't necessarily something that Halo has ratcheted up to 11 in prior games. It always tells a story, but that story isn't necessarily super deep. It usually has one or two pivot points and a basic overall story. Structure. What happens though is that when John shows up, he is a deadlocked cadaver warrior. He's like a Warhammer 40,000 Space Marine, but approximately 100% less religious fervor and a plus one for AI that usually carries that conversation for him. If John was a Hallmark card, he'd be the entire section of we need to see other people. When he drops in, you can hear all those characters cheering for him or laughing or discussing how they want to take out the enemies. And that feels good. It feels like a moment where everybody says collectively, Thank God Master Chief's here. It's about time something went their way, even if their way is just down the wrong tube of a series of battles that swallow enemies on both sides. It's about that gung-ho feeling, something that in the past, it's sort of been lost in Halo for their dire need to tell you some kind of in-depth story. Let's jump into gameplay. From the very start, you're in battle. The game does have a lot of momentary cutscenes to try to draw the line from mainline Halos into the Halo War saga and then swinging back into Infinite to bring you up to speed. It's not nearly as confusing as, say, the Didact was in the prior game. And as I said, all those audio elements do bring it together and help you out. But by the time you swing into the credits many hours later, there might be moments where you're like, dude, wait, what? 
the greatest part and the part that lets you move through all this, no matter what, is John's sense of duty, that continual moving forward. Have you ever seen Brock Lesnar fight where you see him move and you're like, how the hell did he do that? If Brock Lesnar could shoot, Master Chief would basically be him. Seven foot a maniac. He's only quit two times in his life and both times because he was frozen in deep space. The dude's a fucking stencil people would use to spray paint never quit on the graves of enemies. That's why it works so well because John's sense of duty, pushing you forward at all times. It isn't even really hard. Heroic. It doesn't even have to be. He doesn't know he's heroic. He doesn't really care. He just is. He's a gun that shoots bullets that shoots guns that shoot other bullets. Infinite gets all this right by letting you be him throughout the entire thing and possibly the best setting that they could have put it in, which is a repeating section of the first couple hours of the original Halo game. Make no mistake, that's what Infinite is. Aside from that boring ass starting point I talked about, Halo Infinite is basically Halo 1's best parts on infinite rotation at a rock and roll station. And there's two reasons why this succeeds. One is the world size and two is the gameplay. The world size itself is not massive or overdone like let's say a Far Cry or an Assassin's Creed where a lot of times travel becomes the de facto element. That never occurs here. You don't really ever get bogged down. Gameplay is the other one. It hasn't changed a great deal, though this time we do have equipment that can be upgraded. It's not a great deal. You have a shield, the grapple, dash move, and a couple others. The grapple alone is worth the entire cost of entry for infinite, though. With just the use of your directional pad rubbed off into it a little bit, the ability to whip around corners, leap into oblivion and some desperate retreat, but then catch yourself just before falling to your death, or grab a grenade from the ground or a gun from a stand cannot be easily explained on how cool it is. The grapple changes everything from giving you extra reach to grab a gun from behind cover to the ability to move from cover to cover more easily. Where there's also a dash move you can get that can be upgraded. It is normal for all kinds of games where you only get a couple activities at any one time and some of them don't feel necessarily as usable. That certainly does happen here. I felt that the dash, no matter how good it was, no matter how easy it was to switch, which it just never equaled the grapple itself. That grapple is pretty legendary. And speaking of legendary, let's talk about the difficulty. Halo's AI has always been the talk of the town for AI. Even though it's not perfect, for the most part, Halo's AI is considered excellent, especially on Legendary. It makes a return here. Humans are still going to get smashed if you drop a Warthog into the new FOB. But overall, they do fight, they take cover, they take out enemies as they should as do the enemies themselves, but there's a couple small noticeable changes here. I will say that with the normal Covenant, the bosses and the banished, they all seem to slightly have better shots than they did in the prior games. I found that a lot of the shots felt like they were leading a little bit more than I had ever had in other titles. And using the dash or the grapple at times, they were still tagging me in the air and it required me to necessarily change that into more of a juke or a dive or a switch in place or even a slide versus just running as quickly as possible. And luckily, both the enemy AI and yourself have the same old excellent weapons that Halo has always been known for, plus a couple new ones added to the old favorites. While most of these haven't seen any massive switches to how they work, it does feel like the shotgun may not be as punchy as it was in the past. It still cleans house, but something about it actually feels just a little less impactful. I still love the shotgun. Of course, the Needler is and always will be a fantastic weapon, both for you and against you. Few weapons have that gnawing intensity and tracking like the Needler, and resting for just a moment behind cover without checking for incoming Needler shots can be the difference between a moment for your shields to reset and a moment for the game's entire save to reset because you died. This is all backed up by the rock-solid gameplay that Halo has always offered when it comes to movement, aiming, ducking, and just basically traversing the world. Master Chief is light on his feet as a 1,000 pound, seven foot dude can possibly be. Somehow Master Chief has always felt imminently controllable. And that continues here, grappling off the face of a bad guy, slamming down onto him and then leaping away to retreat from gunfire results in exactly what you expected, those moves. There's no soft filter between what you want to do and what you end up doing. Halo is really one of the few games that I've ever played where no matter if I live or die, I look back and I say, you know what? That felt right. 
Sure, some of the guns could do more. They could have more recoil, but it's hard to fault a game like this when you realize this massive soldier is using the same guns that their normal Marines would need to use. Vehicles are the same way here. As you unlock more and more, you can get them at your bases when you respawn into them or when you travel to them. I did notice that with the Scorpion tank, I couldn't not get as many members to jump onto the tank as I had in the prior games. That is something noticeable. I don't know if that'll be patched in. It's something that you can try. However, we also, in the old games, did not get mini bosses, and their inclusion here might make that Scorpion issue worth it because mini bosses themselves, though they're a mixed bag, I think they're a huge improvement. I love the idea. The banished who've sort of entrenched themselves into particular sections of this ring, sometimes with hugely powerful weapons, other times hidden in bases, and more than once just hanging out in the grass with some pals like a fucking projectile picnic is the best thing that they should do on the weekend. Each, though, has a unique story, sometimes dire, sometimes hilarious, and other times you can just track it via narrative in the audio logs that are left around the game world, because apparently instead of saving yourself, grabbing your Zune and recording your last will and testament is a better idea than, you know, running off and living. Each one of the bosses had a very different feel to how they were engaged, and because of the different places in which they were engaged, it always was a unique stylization and presentation problem. I love trying to figure out how to take each one of them on, and on the higher difficulties, that can be rough as hell. All that being said, though, the main bad guy, he's basically a YouTuber trying to fluff out his video time past 10 minutes so he can get some more ads on it. Half of the time, whenever he shows up and whenever you do anything, you just get done kicking the shit out of his people, and he's like, something will happen at some point in the future. And you're like, when, dude? Because I just kicked your ass. He's like, at some point. So then you kick more of his ass, and you kick a dude and one of his best guys, and he's like, it really doesn't matter. I already knew he was going to die. And you're like, seriously? Is anybody listening to this guy? Because if somebody on his team would be listening, they'd be like, fuck you, man. I'm not going out there. Master Chief kicks the shit out of everybody, and he just keeps saying, you just wait, man. All of these parts of the game, when you get these different items that you can join, you get the grapple and the dash, and you get the adjustments to the shield, and you get the fob itself, and you get the ability to grab people and put them into the game world. The result is a game where the starting isn't great, the middle main section is fine, but the ending story is not necessarily bad guy Macbeth central, that's for sure. As you circle around towards the end, you clear up Zeta, the story feels like it's not necessarily going very many places. You do get some answers to some of the questions, but they're questions that I know that when you start playing the game within the first five minutes, you will probably go, this must be the answer. And uh, yeah, you're probably right. Microsoft has to be commended for the consistent work that they do for making sure the games are accessible by as many people as possible. Animation sickness settings, voice to text, all of the things that you would expect. Microsoft really basically continues to lead the industry. And while they don't hit every single thing, they do cut a massive swath through accessibility options. And they offer so many different ways for you to adjust the game to make you comfortable if that's what you need. And that's going to bring us to fun factor. The starting of the game, it's rough. Make no mistake, there's just no two ways about it. It's bland tunnels, some whispering, and a couple bad guys that are just randomly plopped down for you to take out. Once you get into the main Halo part, the main ring, that gameplay that you know and love from the original games is there for a long time. And the ability for you to explore and go about these places is awesome. And it is true. Most of the other characters in the game are sort of like gopher bosses where they just pop up to tell you to go someplace or to do something or ask you to question and then they pop back down again. I get it. That is definitely something that Halo has had a problem with in the past, and it is certainly not fixed here, even with that really bad, bad guy that you end up facing in this game. A lot of the Halo games have always tried to do that with their nemesis, but it's really hard to ever assume the nemesis can take out John. John's just the kind of character that, dude, Deep Space doesn't even kill him. And in a way, that's good because you probably wouldn't want him dead. There's so much to do, so many different battles to have, and the different difficulties that, hey, man, awesome. Playing this game and having moments where you wish you could talk to somebody else who's experiencing those amazing moments with you and not being able to do so is a huge hit. Now, it doesn't hit the original fun that you had. So if the enjoyment you have is a 10, it's not going to make it a 9. But it could make the enjoyment from a 10 to a 15 or a 20, especially because numerical systems absolutely break down and make no fucking sense whatsoever. But you get my drift. It could be much more enjoyable to be doing it with somebody else. And I got to tell you, I missed it throughout the entire campaign. There was not one point where I was playing this game where I was not like, man, this would be 10, 20, 30, 40 times better with co-op, 50 times, 60 times better with co-op. 
70 times better. As IGN would say, 10 out of 10 for sure. That much better. Cyberpunk 2077, best game ever. So as you guys know, I rate games on a buy, wait for sale, rent, or never touch it again rating system. This is definitely a buy. It is uh, lacking co-op, which is an absolute smash in the nuts. It would be so good to be out there and be doing this co-op with somebody else. But I got to tell you, whatever difficulty you're on, jumping in there, grabbing some various different changes to the vehicles that you can unlock, taking out some of those mini bosses, and admittedly going through the story, though it's no great shakes, is something that is for sure an incredible title to experience. Very cool combat regardless and something that you could definitely return to time and time again, especially if you don't take out all of the bounties or the mini bosses right away, because each one of those can be pretty difficult. Also, some of the locations in the game that you can take over can be quite difficult as well, depending on the difficulty. So those will all be fun to do. And hopefully co-op gets added soon, though, from what I understand, it's not going to be added until probably mid-year of next year. So anyway, that's it for me. I hope you guys liked the video. If you did, give it a thumbs up. If you didn't, well, you can't give it a thumbs down. If you didn't do whatever... Be one of the first thousand people to leave a comment on this video and you'll get absolutely nothing but my love. That's it for me. Hope you guys all enjoy it. Peace out. Enjoy the rest of your week.